It's Comics Are Great, the visual, visual storytelling show. I got to find a way to say that more clearly. I trip on that one every time, Matt. Recorded live at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely, frigid Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Comics.aedl.org. And this is the show where we talk about visual storytelling, making comics, drawing comics, writing comics, uh, all of the things that surround this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And we're going to talk about film today. What? Comics? That's not has nothing to do with film. Oh, au contraire. There's a lot to do with film. Uh, comics and film share a lot of DNA, as we explored in episode 86 with returning guest Cole Glass. Hey, Cole. Hey, how's it going? Cole of eventidecreative.com. Uh, Emmy winning uh, director? Director. So, writer. Uh, you're director and writer, filmmaker, right? Editor. Editor, too. That's right. Yeah. That's what I'm doing right now. So, What, what, what are you doing right now? Uh, so the, the guys that I made Orc Wars with um, made another movie called Mythica, and I'm editing the first, the first one. It was, it's, a, it's a series. And... Is it going to be a web series, or is it going to be uh, for a cable network? Or... Um, it, is, it has been designed so it can either be 10 episodes or five features and they're shooting three of them mm. they shot three of them to see to see if they should do the rest so oh wow i'm doing the, so right now they're features but i'm doing the i'm editing the first one i hope we can get to dig into that a little bit during today's discussion you yes yeah, you mentioned orc wars so mm -hmm. you were the director of orc wars feature uh dare ostwind which we talked about in episode 86 of the show uh but a guy who thinks a lot and very hard about visual storytelling uh, I'm wondering for those who haven't checked out episode 86 yet, and you should, uh, that's at comicsagreat.com slash CAG86. What is Orc Wars about? You described it as uh, the Chronicles of Narnia in reverse, right? Or the Lion, Witch, the Wardrobe in reverse. Right, right. It's about, it's about how there's a portal between a fantasy world and our world, and then orcs come through and uh, kind of a loner PTSD special forces guy has to fight them. He's kind of called as the guardian. It's fantasy stuff, but there's machine guns. <laughs> that, That's that, all you need to know. That is pretty awesome, and we, sh we showed some video of that while we were talking about it. So thank you once again for returning to the show, Cole. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this with you today. About, Thanks like, for having me. What cartoonists can learn from the process of filmmakers. So uh, new to the show, in studio... <laughs> we have Donald Harrison, Donald Harrison, of uh, former director of the Ann Arbor Film Festival, independent filmmaker. You make a lot of interesting kinds of films. You do documentaries. You do experimental films. Uh, you, you and our other guests, which I will introduce in a moment, you guys worked on a project with the University of Michigan Museum of Art, Many Voices. So you also teach film, too. Can you want to talk about the kind of stuff you do or what you did at UMA at the Museum of Art? Sure. I, I sort of come from a documentary filmmaking background. In the last couple of years, I've been getting a lot more creative in terms of how you can approach documentary. And some projects have really lent themselves to exploration and uh, sort of getting more involved in the teaching side of things. So the Museum of Art at U of M uh, brought in myself and actually Sherrod, our other guest, uh, to help run a project that had um, really great uh, grant funding, foundational funding, to get 16 people in our community, some who had never made a film, some who were artists of other medium, and some who had made films, to each pick a work of art in the museum and then make a short video in response to it. So not about it directly, mm -hmm. but inspired by that work of art. And then those videos are next to those, uh, they're attached to, they're linked to those works of art in the museum. And so we saw a whole spectrum of ways to approach film and video and got to work with people at different stages. So it was very hands-on and very rewarding to work on so many projects all at once. Uh, yeah, I, you and Sherrod, and I'll, we can introduce Sherrod now and talk about both of you guys together. Uh, Sherrod Patel, uh, another filmmaker, writer, director, also musician, uh, musician right. at uh, SoundCloud uh, UFO Club 1977, right? Correct. Right. Uh, <laughs> And then you're, you're at uh, crop.com slash Sherrod, uh, too. But you guys worked together on the UMA project, and uh, you guys were sort of like advising, teaching, and coaching these people who had never made a movie before. Uh, that must have been interesting. Did, 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 I'm wondering if you guys like unboxed anything about your own process by working with absolute novices like that. 
Definitely. I don't know. I'm, I would imagine Sherrod would say yes as well. I mean, yeah. Working, working with Sherrod, uh, learned a lot in terms of how we approach things differently. And I'm excited about today's conversation, having people with sort of different approaches to working together and, you know, found it very complimentary. But then working with people across all different types of movies. I mean, we, we had everything from animation to found footage mashup, narrative, documentary, experimental documentary, surrealist abstractions, <laughs> films we couldn't <laughs> classify anymore. And so, yeah, it definitely yeah. made me think about how I approach work to see so many different people approach it in ways that made sense to them. And that's why I kind of wanted to bring the three of you guys together for this discussion is that I think that this is a good representation of how, you know, I teach comics classes, as many people watch the show know, um, and I, one of the hardest things, I think, for a visual storyteller to learn is what is their particular approach that works best for them. And, like, you know, there's lots of how-to books. Well, you have to write a script. You have to write a script before you can start thumbnailing. You know, and then some people say, no, you got a thumbnail, and then you'll find the script. And then, or, you know, some people go right to direct to final art, you know. And which is the right answer? Well, there is no right answer. You've got to find that answer for yourself. And I think polling different creative people to find out what they do uh, will help inform that. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, now that you're no longer director of the Ann Arbor Film Festival, uh, are you able to talk about what a director of, the, of a film festival actually does uh, besides field <laughs> emails saying, why didn't you accept my film, jerk? <laughs> <laughs> There's some of that for sure. Uh, I'm sure they're dealing with that right now, having probably just sent out a couple thousand notifications of people who didn't get in. Yeah. And of course, now I'm on the other side, which has been fun. I finished up a film that I started six years ago with a friend out in San Francisco, and we thought it would be a fun project sort of a mockumentary superhero action comedy. And it took us six years to make this fun little project. And we've been sending it out to festivals and getting the, hey, we loved your film, but yeah, we had so many to choose from, sorry. And then, you know, getting acceptances, fortunately, as well. So yeah, definitely um, responding to the people who want it to be something else or, or not happy about the fact that, you know, there's only 100 slots in 3,000 films. But, uh, yeah, trying to remember everybody's name, that was one of the, <laughs> the harder things, too, out of the couple thousand people you would know. How many films do you wind up watching before the festival? Uh, I think for me, I typically would review upwards of 1,000 of the 2,500 or 3,000. Wow. But we had an entire team, and they still they have 30, 40 people that are reviewing films for about six months. Uh, labor of love. Yeah. And you see all kinds of things you never would have seen, and nobody probably will see, <laughs> because <laughs> a lot of them will not really be seen at any festival. Well, there's always community television. There's always the internet. There's, there's always, always, there's yeah, always there's, an audience, your friends, your family. There's always YouTube. That's right. I mean, here I am. Right? Right? Look at, everybody's looking at me on YouTube right now. Uh, well, remembering names, I imagine that's, that's a big one. And then it also, yeah, just, just fielding that many videos. And reminding people who make things that for festivals, conventions, things like that, there's people running the thing behind the scenes. There's human beings who are doing their level best to sift through all this information and try to make a judgment call. So, yeah, a lot of, lot of different tensions going on there that I'm sure would make for a whole different discussion. But visual storytelling, that's what's on the docket today. Um, so, okay. So we have documentary filmmaker, experimental filmmaker. Sherrod, you do experimental films as well. Uh, I, 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 I do more, um, I mean, I guess I have more of a history of doing narrative, narrative projects. Yeah. Uh, because I started, uh, I started from comics myself, you know, uh, as a kid drawing comics. So I think of, I, I think I broke into movie making as an evolution uh, from comics and from illustrating. So That's funny. That's how Cole, that's how you got into filmmaking too, right? Yeah. yeah. And you guys were giving me flack last time about, <laughs> giving up the dream of comics going for film, but I don't think that was me. I think that was Jake more than anybody else. Jake Parker was yeah. on with you, and he was he was razzing you about that. But yeah, yeah. And, and actually, can can we just put this one to bed right now? This whole idea of because there's like this tension in comics about like other media, uh, because like a lot of superhero movies are getting made now, and like the, the, right. the general public says like, oh well, that must be the trophy. If you make a really great comic, then right. your real vindication is getting a film. If that's the case for you as an artist, good on you. You got a film made and you're really happy about it. If you don't want to have a film made about your comic, you don't have to. One's not better than the other. They're, they're just different mediums. Can we just like put that whole like tension and argument to bed, please? Right. They're yeah, different things. 
For real. And I think, I mean, I think it's fine. I, the, everyone has an evolution, you know, everyone has a path. Um, now in retrospect, I think, you know, I was much more suited for film than comics. And so I don't regret, but yeah, I mean, I started off wanting to be a comic book artist and, and, uh, you know, I just kind of found my way to film. And when I found my way to film, it made more sense to me. So, but I still, you know, I still, I agree. Like every, every medium deserves the respect and it doesn't, you know, they don't need to be stepping stones to the end all, you know, movie making, you know, I, I just feel like that's just, that doesn't serve anybody. No, I, I love celebrating what each one does better than the other. Right, that's that's worthy of discussion, but to suggest that that makes one better than the other, right? That one medium is superior is silly. That's just silly juvenile talking. And if you talk that way, you're a juvenile. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk like grownups about this thing. Uh, so okay, so but but like as you guys like shared and Cole, I mean, if you guys started in comics, I mean, there's got to be a lot of shared DNA between the two mediums that you've seen in your explorations of both, right? I, I think so. I mean, for example, when I when I uh, watch a movie and I and I remember it or I think or I evaluate a movie in my head, I almost lay it out like a comic book of all the frames or key key moments that I remember. Um, so I often go backwards in the way I think about movies. I kind of imagine them as panels or or stills and then like as did it make a good sequence? You know, what, did that movie flow well? And I think of it in terms of almost like a static chart sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. Like, like the, the, the key moments freeze for you. Like yeah, uh, often, you know, and even in my own work, um, when I think about it, I think about like, are there good, you know, like could I pause, could I pause my movie every, you know, few minutes or a few seconds and get a cool frame? Is there a variety in there, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, I think about it in a in a comic in a graphic sense, you know. Right, and then I would imagine also in visual composition and the cutting between shots. Like for instance, you know, the example I use in my classrooms all the time with kids is, you're watching Sesame Street. There's Ernie and Bert. Here's here's Bert. Here's Ernie. And if in panel two, you do that and they switch them, the reader's gonna go, well, "Why did they switch? I didn't see why they suddenly moved." I imagine in a film you're worried about the same thing, the same kind of like blocking and arrangement of visual elements, right? Yeah. It's called yeah, I think I think they're really similar, actually. Yeah. What, what were you saying, Cole? It's called what? The one eighty rule. What's the one eighty? Where you don't you don't cross the line. Oh. Because all of a sudden, some people will be looking. Like if you, you shoot the whole scene, I'm looking this way, and all of a sudden, I'm looking this way. Yeah. And Jared's also looking this way. Then we're looking. <laughs> we're not looking at each other anymore. Right. Okay. So. Uh, so so That's stipulated. We're going to break yeah. that rule the rest of the show now. Everybody start looking in different directions at all times. <laughs> I'm looking up. Here we go. To my left. Experimental. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> We're going to make an experimental film. Uh, okay, so, so so stipulated that comics and film have a lot of similarities. So uh, then any naysayers who were like, oh, film, whatever. No, stay on board. This is going to be good. Um, so what I'm curious about what you exploring in your guys' process is landing the idea, finding the narrative, right? Um, you are, you're on a walk one day and you have this moment of what Campbell called the aesthetic arrest, right? Like that such a place should exist, that such a moment in time should exist and I'm, I'm one with this moment and I'm captivated by it and I need to reflect that in the world. I need to express what this moment meant to me. Uh, that's not a narrative, that's inspiration, right? That's being inspired by something and, and excited by something, but how do you know the difference between what is something that arrests you and grabs you and something where there's a story, there's this idea, there's something to be I mean, – even in an experimental film, you're expressing a narrative, right? I mean, it's not just pure, you know, Dadaism, right? Well, actually, well. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's films that really stretch what, what a film could be about. Sure. And whether there is narrative, but yeah, there's there's some there's some idea being yeah. expressed, and sometimes it is really to even deconstruct anything related to story. Because limited aesthetic, we can talk about that film that people can find on your Vimeo page, which is this really visually fascinating, you know, uh, intimate look at video game art with like audio from different people talking about video game art, 
and uh, they were when I I saw the film, and there was a structure. Maybe structure. It was it was it was abstract, but there was an idea being conveyed, and there was and it felt like it was an intentional journey through that that exploration of that idea, right? Oh, definitely. And I think for me, the more work I do, the more I'm starting to build off of what what a documentary is, and starting to incorporate more narrative pieces. But I think I also look at things a lot as sort of a mashup artist in the musical realm does. And mm -hmm. sort of thinking in terms of these containers, these pieces and buckets, and sometimes being interested in seeing what happens when they collide together. Mm -hmm. So I'm almost maybe a little more of like a scientist in how I approach working with this raw material. Go, go collect raw material, have a theory or a thesis, and then see what happens when this, uh, we had a, a professor of color theory talking about this painting in the museum, and then we had actually Eli from the library talking directly about early classic 80s video games and then we just mashed together their interviews in a way then trying to find uh, the common threads and, and make it seem like they're in conversation even though they're talking about somewhat related but different subjects and to me that was exciting to try to find the story within this this material not knowing exactly how if it would work out so you're a visual chemist Ooh, I like that. You're a visual <laughs> chemist. A little bit okay. of H2SO4 and some NaCl, and we get, a, we get a story. No, actually, you know, this kind of heuristics, you're talking about heuristics, right? You're talking right. about, like, a little bit of trial and error. Like, let's put these things together. That, that's art, right? A lot of artists do that. I mean, Cole and or Sherrod, can you guys weigh in on this? Do you guys do that kind of, like, uh, mixing and matching of elements when you're trying to explore an idea? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, settled. I it's settled. I mean, it's funny because as we were talking, I was thinking about it. Like when I was when I was younger, um, in my twenties, I was I would come up with an image. You know, I'd have an I'd have an idea for an image, and I was like, I got to write a story for this. And as I've gotten older and I've done this more, like more professionally, I. I come out of reverse where I, I'll think of an idea like something will happen or I'll hear a story or I'll watch a movie or you know what I do I get a lot of ideas because I'll watch trailers and I'll misunderstand what they're about <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like that sounds so cool and then I'll find out the movie wasn't about that yeah. and then I'm like oh well I'll just write that story because nobody else has written it and I just misunderstood so like Something like that will happen, and then I'll go back and try to get an image for it, like try to create the images. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but that's that's kind of how I think I try to play with it, where, you know, I as recently I come at it way more from the side of like, you know, this is the story I want to tell, then how visually am I going to do it, as opposed to, you know, like, I'd have an image of like somebody in a robe jumping off of a cliff with a right. sword, and then I'm like, okay, what's this, this guy's story? You know what I'm saying? Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I've worked both ways, and I found strengths and and minuses to both ways. Where I'll have an idea for a character in the way they feel and the way they act, but I don't know what they look like or what they, what gender they are, or what you know if they're from another planet or whatever. It'll just be like I need a sallow, smarmy person for this particular moment in what I want <laughs> right. to do, or I want I want a sallow, smarmy person to be the lead of this thing that I want to do. What are they? You know, are they a doctor? Are they, you know, a, a street manager of sanitation? What? Uh, and then other times I'll have, like, I just drew a really cool-looking robot kid, you know? Right. Like, I wonder what I could do with that. I wonder where the narrative is there. Um, but both, both present different kinds of problems, right? Because I think, and let me ask you guys, how does starting with an image, are there any dangers to starting with an image or starting with the idea first that you've run into personally? Like not to say like let's let's be let's get on the uh, let's let's do a homily and preach to people, but but uh, but like have you ever run into a situation where like because I know I have where I have an image that's really compelling, and then I'm so hung up on that image that I can't I can't work anything into it right I've made a box right. that I can't fit anything into and I just got this really cool image. Sure, just you know, just losing thousands of hours of time. <laughs> working on your project that's all i mean other than that it's not a problem yeah I've, I've encountered that i mean i think with documentary you always hear these stories of the metallica documentary we shot 200 hours or 500 hours or 10,000 hours whatever the case is well then 
you're going to spend two, three, four, five times that many hours going through it and figuring out how to turn that into a story. And so it's inherent to doing documentary that you tend to have a high shooting ratio because you want to you want to just roll and, and capture those moments that aren't scripted. But then sometimes, for me, in, in my earlier projects, I would have an idea and I would sort of set certain conditions or rules and concepts into it that I thought were really interesting. And then it, I would sort of be very much sort of trapped by that and then having to do a lot more work trying to follow these certain ideas. And those didn't necessarily translate to the best film. So in my, you know, my um, more recent work, I've been really looking at the ways in which I think in those rules or in those structures or concepts, and then making sure I'm not getting stuck in those and sort of breaking beyond that to make sure the work has life to it and you also get it done. How do you not let yourself get stuck? How do you protect yourself from that? You know, showing stuff to other people that you trust, I think, can be good. Working with people like Sherrod, who go, why, why are you going back and forth over and over like that's the idea well okay but maybe maybe it doesn't need to be that so mm-hmm. just having a few people that can help you sort of see those blind spots i found to be very valuable uh i want i want to round off this idea on finding the narrative by talking with Sherry just for a second about um so we showed some some video from your film an apple a day which <laughs> donald informed me you made in nine hours yeah it was one of those um what, what was it called? It was a... Uh, Cinema Sports. Cinema Sports, where you get an assignment. You have to, like, include certain elements in the movie, and you usually you, ha- you have a team of filmmakers. They get their assignment in the morning, and then that evening they screen what they made. But uh, I did this one solo. <laughs> okay, so were you given any other cues? beyond like, What was the assignment that you were given? Uh, there was a time limit, I would think, and, and you ha- I had to include an apple. Uh, a, a, the opening of a box and something old-fashioned. Okay, so it wasn't like, oh, you have to do a story about, you know, alienation, right? No, not there at all. No, no yeah. thematic constraints. No, it was more like they gave you these specific, you could say, images or uh, really literal kind of elements, you know, except something old-fashioned could be interpreted any way, right? It but, could be you're drinking an old-fashioned. Right. <laughs> well, and, and I actually came up with those elements, so I hosted the event, yeah. and it was always interesting, and I hosted these a few different times, trying to come up with elements that wouldn't lead to the obvious joke. You know, <laughs> you would just think of like, oh, let's do peanut, like, they have to include peanut butter, and you're like, oh, man, it's going to be just like the same gag over banana, or, you know, you're yeah. trying to figure out things that could be more interesting devices, so that was always a challenge. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, well, the trick is to not get too specific, but not be too vague. Right? Exactly. Uh, but okay. So then, question, Sherrod, you got uh-huh. nine hours to do this movie, and you got these 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 physical constraints. Have you got to put these things in it? Right. How do you find the idea? How do you land on there? That's where the story is. That's where I got to get. Is is it something where you're heuristing it, using heuristics? Like, oh, let's play with a few different shots and see what I, what happens when I look at them together? Or do you set out uh, to, like, write out ideas? Do you take pictures? Do you doodle? Like, what, what's your process of getting to the... Yeah, kind of... it, it is a matter of coming up with um, compelling, like, looking at those those elements that were required, quick quickly looking at what you could realistically do that day. Like, what is... What could you photograph around you because this is a video, right? Or what could you, what found footage or found images could you use? Quickly weighing that in and just coming up with some compelling way to represent those required elements, but then more importantly, flow from one to the other. And I think that's where the narrative comes from is you have these different images or different elements how do you connect them in time so that you hit you're hit with one and then the other and then the other and it makes some kind of emotional sense i think that's called story you know some kind of emotional sense i like that i like that a lot because uh you know it doesn't have to necessarily be logical as long as it makes emotional sense right 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 like like you could have one of the elements like pass by, by behind the character's head to represent that they're thinking about that thing at that moment, which is illogical, right, mm-hmm. visually, but if, if the context of all the other visual elements permit that, that, mo- that action to happen and if it resonates in some kind of emotional way. Correct, and I, I think if you're going in the more in the experimental direction, then you really are dealing with not logical connections, but 
how, what reactions, you know, or what is the spark, you know, without having to think literally uh, like story logic. But uh, in my case, I, you know, I made it, I made what is a very literal story, a very simple story you know, using those elements. Um, I think what's funny though, is when it screened, I remember Donald, you, you actually said in the microphone, you said, did it, did it have all the elements? Like you, like you, you got into it, I think, and watched it and didn't even realize or didn't count if I had included all the elements or not. <laughs> well, that's a good sign, right? That means that he was gripped by the story and not doing, you know, bean counting or that you didn't, <laughs> that you didn't put a lampshade on everything. Like, hey, look at I used the thing, right? right. Which a lot of them would do that sort of very <laughs> obvious reference that made no sense in their piece just to include it. Uh, it is it important to you guys that people don't think about what they're watching while they're watching it? Cole, I'm wondering if you think about that at all. Um, you know, there's something, there's something very magical about postmodernism, I think, that kind of calls attention to itself. Um, I think that it limits the narrative. It limits the, uh, I would say, the emotional sense. The share it's this you know like like it, it it intentionally pushes people out now whether that's intentional or not i you know it, it's fun when it's intentional it's a, it's bad when it's unintentional but i think there's a place for it you know what i'm saying i think there's a place for a you know a, a wink at the at the audience um if your story if it's right for your story so i wouldn't i wouldn't throw you know i wouldn't throw a blanket on all of it and say Nah, you need it to be completely immersive. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, like the movie Gravity. You know, like I watched that movie and I was just, I, I was blown away by it. But I was also sitting there trying my hardest to figure out how they did that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't sitting there going, I was so there. You know, I was, <laughs> it was, I was in the movie. I was sitting there going, this is freaking amazing. How did they do it? How did they do it? Yeah. And. I don't think that ruined the experience for me at all. In fact, I think in some ways it made it better because I was more impressed with it. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like yeah. I, was, I was more moved by the art of it. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a time and place, but, I, but again, you, you hope that that's a creative decision that you've made and not, um, not because, you know, you know, like with Orc Wars, we have the, we had a review. Somebody wrote a review on IMDb that was like pretty scathing, and it's all about how you can see the bottom of the orc's shoes, and there's molded um, rubber soles, mm. and this would be ridiculous for an orc to be wearing. <laughs> that kind of stuff you don't like. You hope audiences don't notice it, even though right. there's no way around it. I could not get authentic boots, right? Like that's just ridiculous. So yeah. But I think I think you can like if you want if you want and if it's right it's fun you know. I, well, yeah, I think of uh, a movie I've talked about a lot of times on the show, uh, you know, The Great Muppet Caper, where part of the conceit of the film is that they know that we're watching them make a movie, and so Kermit and, and the, the, where I think it comes to an apex is Kermit and Miss Piggy get into a lover's quarrel in the the narrative of the story, and then. They break character and get into another fight as an older married couple kind of fight. So, like, they had the young <laughs> lovers fight in the narrative. Then all of a sudden, Miss Piggy breaks character. And then they get into a really big fight uh, as, you know, like, people have been together for a long time. And I thought that in that context, it was brilliant, you know? Yeah. But uh, – and then I also think of – I think of things like I just started watching that um, – House of Cards show with uh, right. Kevin Spacey where he's constantly turning to explain what he's thinking. Uh, right. By the way, yeah. that, that show's all about bad guys. Are there any TV shows where there's good guys as the main characters anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, but uh, there's a book. There's a book called Difficult Men that's okay. all about that. Oh, really? And, yeah, it's about how we've become, how we have the television. It started with Sopranos, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's mostly HBO shows. But it's, I would recommend that book. It is, it is really, it, it's a very interesting commentary on our, our current social situation. Difficult Men. Difficult man, I can't remember who it's by, but I'm sure 
It just it just made me want to go back and watch Quantum Leap again because I was like, I need to watch a show where a really really good guy does nice things. <laughs> yeah. Because like everybody in that show is just so awful. Uh, and anybody who has any streak of goodness or tries to do good, ruin falls upon them. That's terrible. But but anyway, so uh, but to let's let's move on to talk about like okay, you got the idea, you found it, you found something where there there seems to be a story in this thing. Now it gets to you know, uh, preparing to make it. And something that you've been kind of skirting around a little bit, Donald, is this idea of, and it reminds me of something a friend of mine, um, Rob Stenzinger of the Lean Into Art cast, Rob Stenzinger, or interactive-storyteller.com. He just finished a book, uh, an interactive ebook, um, which I'll link to in the show notes. It's at creativecodekit.com. And when he was making the book, the description he said is he, he amassed a stupid amount of content. Like he just was buried in notes, explorations, sketches, potential work, uh, scenarios, and workflows for the book, um, and inevitably discovered that, oh, the simple idea I had in the, at the outset was actually the best idea. But he didn't know that until he amassed a stupid amount of content. So this presents some you know, logistical challenges when you're making a film, right? Uh, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about, okay, you got the idea, and then now it starts, we start amassing the content and how you sift through it. I wonder if we could start with you, Donald. Sure. Yeah. No, actually, you made me think of a couple of things. One is that sometimes it's that really simple idea that I made a film in nine hours that ends up being better than the film. Maybe, <laughs> you know, for me, I think the first film I ever made is maybe one of my stronger pieces. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't make it too complicated. I didn't try to do too much with it. In some ways, that sort of retained the most sort of creative spirit to it. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I think you know, especially with film, there's so much technology that is um, often involved, and it makes me jealous of a lot of writers and Cartoon, graphic novel yeah. and cartoonists. Yeah, I get where, to do whatever. Right, and and you know, of course, there's technology involved to some extent, but just in terms of like for filming it and then editing and the the just well, obviously the expense of all the equipment, uh, whether you're buying it or renting it, um, or finding ways to work around that. But but I think a lot of times you can get lost in all of the technology, all of the different moving parts that you have to put together and start to lose sight of sort of that inspiration and what will ultimately translate onto the screen for a viewer into the experience you want them to have, which maybe for your film is them getting lost and not even realizing they're watching a movie, or maybe it's them appreciating the process and the technique or whatever it is, but just having that sort of magic, that movie magic come through on the screen is I think sometimes really tough to get through all those parts and processes. And that's ultimately, I think, what for myself as a filmmaker I've been working on mastering is getting all those skills and those, um, those pieces worked out so that you can then ultimately translate your idea, your vision, your story for the audience. And easier said than done. <laughs> So when you're when you're amassing this content, I mean, do you have any kind of guiding idea, or I mean, is it just like let's just shoot everything? Like we're gonna we're gonna show um, uh, a preview of a thing that you're working on right now. Uh, you worked on with Sherrod, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you were putting together this this, well, I wonder if we just switch to that now. Uh, Matt, can we pull up that video and we'll just sit quiet while it runs? Yeah, who are the creators? The Summer Game is a really powerful tool for engaging our community. The Summer Game is probably almost as fun to make as it is to play. That's one of the nice things about making clues is that you can design a clue that's only two sentences long and have three or four different ways that people can come at it. What's fun about it, there's the treasure hunt element, which, you know, humans love to hunt and gather. There's something magical happening between the parents and the kids when the whole family can be involved as a team. You have kids saying things to you like, this is so important to me. And what, I mean, how many seven-year-olds say that about anything? Meet seven-year-old Suleiman. What I like about the game is the researching and I'm pretty much learning a lot more new stuff. For us, it's fun because we hang out together and like, it's an alternative to just watching cartoons. It's really fun and it keeps me busy. All right, so what did we just see? This was like a preview for the summer game launch at the AEDL this summer, right? Um, 
And we saw a lot of stuff in there. We saw, <laughs> you know, <laughs> interviews with librarians. We saw the inside of Eli Nyberger's office, which apparently uh, is <laughs> is the is also the home of Sith Lords. Uh, and then there was like all these clips of things that were sort of like supporting the narrative in there. Like there was clips from like Harry Potter and clips from other like old dinosaur films and stuff. Uh, so I'm curious, like, how do you arrive at that? Like, what did you, did you just like, well, we're going to have to have people talking, so we'll get around a bunch of interviews. But then when you're like walking around uh, the library and shooting video, and then also the clips, where did that come in? So, right. So that, and that was uh, an excerpt from uh, about a three minute uh, educational promotional video that's going to come out next month for the library summer game. And I guess it's a, what, promo, edu promo. <laughs> we'll, we'll come up with a word for that. But it's um, for me that was that was a great example of why I love collaboration with people who approach things a little differently. So Sheridan and I put that together, and you know we we sort of had this very open ended make a film about the summer game so people understand what it is and it's actually really amazing and um, and so we sort of approached it from well we want to make this video also fun. The game's very much fun first, mm -hmm. and all everything follows from there, and so then. I think the result is really a, um, sort of the byproduct of Sherrod's creativity saying, hey, let's put them in the Death Star. I'm sort of imagining this room sort of having this, <laughs> this sort of look to it and, you know, having the ability to do that. And so, you know, it's kind of a combination of, of some narrative and story and then also documentary and going and shooting footage of people that play the game and then weaving them into that. And so, yeah, I think it, it sort of combined both Sherrod's background and mine into one one piece. So you're talking about the aboutness of the piece. I mean, not to get too artsy about it, but I mean, you're talking about like, what is this about? And then using that as a yardstick to measure your creative decisions within the, the parameters of the project. Does that sound fair? Sherrod? Sherrod? Um, well, I, I think the reason that you've got all these chaotic kind of elements that are somehow pulled in and somehow make sense when you watch it is because um i mean my thinking was that's what the game is actually like like when when donald described the game to me and and, and it involved a lot of trivia or it involved a lot of pop culture I, I thought well why doesn't the promotion of it also take that same sort of form you know of like this whole landscape unpredictable landscape of pop culture so that was that was my reasoning like my logic and the way in the style that it's you know of using all these you know, different things so the subject matter too right like mm -hmm. so like like looking at the subject matter and just not about what it is but also what it represents what is the experience of the subject matter itself and how can i parallel or replicate that within the the, the context of my project yeah exactly the word parallel yeah to try to parallel the experience of it because I felt like that that was just an interesting sort of uh, a way to approach it that would kind of like be a fun guideline and then but it also like opened the doors like well then we can do anything <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but there's still a guiding idea there. There's still uh -huh. some kind of yardstick to to like sort of check yourself against. Uh, now I want to hear from the uh, the the fiction storyteller uh, in the room, uh, the, the the fantasy storyteller Cole. Uh, do you do anything similar to that when you're building your tales? Is like what's the the big idea? What's the yardstick? How do I how do I check in on something? Because I'll tell you, I had a conversation with a writing partner once where I wanted to introduce three characters who were an inside joke to Transformers fans, and, I, and it, into the story. And like the, these guys are going to do a walk on, and it's and like the five Transformers fans who actually recognize this are going to laugh so hard. And he's like, well, "What's that got to do with what the story's about?" I'm like nothing he's like well then it doesn't need to be in there does it you know and i i conceded i was like okay yeah that was just like a self <laughs> self-indulgent thing i wanted to throw in um so I, I learned then that like oh you gotta have something to check in on or do you have some other method that you used to check in on the the, the process of the things you're putting it together um you know sadly i would say the number one thing is just practicality mm. um just the just the ability like what what can you shoot you know what i'm saying like we like with work wars they had the the producers came and said we want a dragon to fight a tank and i said <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> and they said no that's what we, we have to have it we feel like that will in that in a trailer is going to be very sellable and so i was like well if we can make if i'm like if we can get a tank there 
and make sense, you know, then sure. And so I worked on it and I felt like I found a good reason why a tank would be there. And then we're shooting as we're getting ready to shoot. They're like, Hey, by the way, we can't get a tank. And I was like, you told me to put a tank in there, you know, like, come on. Right. And they said, we can get a half track. And I, and I had written the scene in a tank, right? Like a, a, a half track is like a, a truck. It's open. The tank is closed. You know what I'm saying? And if yeah. you're fighting a dragon, that's going to have different ramifications. The dragon could possibly blow on the tank and not hurt you. But in a half track, you're toast. So I had to rewrite. And, but that's kind of how it evolved. Like we didn't, you know, like it was, okay, it was a tank, but then it became a half track because we didn't have a tank. And the only reason we had a, didn't have a tank, by the way, is because the people who own tanks uh, in Utah, there's a lot of people who own tanks for some reason, <laughs> like collectors. Okay. I thought you were going yeah, yeah, someplace no. else and with that. I'm sure there's some apocalyptic <laughs> people, but they don't, they don't talk about their tanks very often. But there are, people, there are quite a few people, and they, and they put them in the movies. They'll, you can rent them, but they only want them to be like authentic World War II type movies. Like they, they have their passion. They don't make their money by renting tanks. They, they're, you know, so they're like, oh, I'll put my tank in there if, if it's you know, an authentic World War II movie. Ours wasn't, so we couldn't get one. Anyway, um, so I think the practicality of it is is large. Um, I think that there's a place for, uh, kind of like you're saying the, the the references to Transformers. I think there's a place for that, as long as it doesn't take away. I um, I just recently saw a thing about how they on a recent episode of My Little Pony they had um, a Doctor Who pony and and uh, Rose, and they just walked by. And, you know, it went viral because everybody who loves Doctor Who, and there's some people who love My Little Pony and Doctor Who, mm -hmm. um, it was a fun nod. You know what I'm saying? But it's also like, how much time is it going to take? And, you know, in My Little Pony, they just draw it and it's no big deal. But what if, you know, like, what if I was going to do a Doctor Who reference in my movie with a character that I have to buy a costume? You know what I'm saying? Like, all of a sudden, it's like, I have to get an actor who looks like. And it just starts getting complicated for how much it's going to be for. You know what I'm saying? So I think, I think the idea that does it serve the story is very good. Um, is it practical? Can you pull it off? Is it another good? You know, there, these, are, these are definitely big guidelines. But sadly, it's always like the budget, like how much, you know, how much you can pull off. Actually, I would, I would argue or submit, and I would love to hear you guys' re reactions to this, is that those, I mean, a common theme on the Comics Are Great show is limitations breed creativity. Trying to get yourself out of a really difficult creative problem is where creativity really happens. And to just say to some young artist, you have an infinite budget, you have infinite time and infinite ideas, go forth and make greatness. It's not, well, first of all, it's impossible. That'll never happen. But second of all, uh, it just seems like you're setting yourself up to fail more because you aren't hemmed in and have to fight your way out. Um, and, and I think like when you talk about practicality, like in terms of budget, in terms of materials, the cartoonist is facing that with a page. Every page presents, you've got this much room and you've got to tell this much story in this much room. And I just ran into this with a page I was thumbnailing where it's like, this moment is really important, therefore it has to be a big panel on the page. I have to give a lot of real estate to it because it's a really critical moment of the story. This smaller moment, more stuff is happening in it. I've got four characters talking in two caption boxes and I've only got this much room. How do I make that work so as not to confuse the reader? How do I make this so it's not a jumbled mess? And I redrew that panel, I think, about six or seven times. And when I landed it, it was great. And I was like, I am a cartoonist, right? But that, that limitation, I could say, like, well, just an unhappy fact of life, kid. You can't fight City Hall. Sometimes pages are too small. Uh, or you could look at it as, hey, guess what? I'm going to hem you in, and your ability to fight out of this little roadblock I put in front of you is your measure of success as a, as a storyteller, right? I don't know. Right. Do you guys run into this limitations thing, like creating brilliant new ways of looking at a subject that you never thought of before? Yeah, I think I think when you're when you're responding well to those limitations and when you're <laughs> responding well to the failures, <laughs> then by all means, I think that you know in the in the creative process for a lot of people, they they then let that limit them. They let that. I mean, it's really up yeah. to you as as an artist to figure out if you're gonna rise above that and you know i think failure can be a really great inspiration even within the piece where 
you went out and you shot this whole scene and it's a complete disaster and then you realize you know what we're going to animate that or we're going to we're going to do something else or we're maybe we didn't need to do that and you end up going in a different direction this um mockumentary I did with a friend we had to rush into production and it was a uh, mostly improvised uh, acting with people who weren't actors we outlined the story and we just had a lot of holes you know some of the scenes i mean our cinematographer you know blew an entire entire scene where it all came out so dark we couldn't see it and you know we ended up reshooting that that scene but you know we had to very, get creative to figure out how to fill these gaps and fill these holes and you know ideally we would have had time and money to actually shoot it all the way we intended but it just meant we took it in a different direction and ended up adding in some extra uh, elements that were creative response to the places that we sort of fell short. Yeah, and and often an audience doesn't even know that that's happening. Well, ideally, an audience doesn't know all that stuff. Ideally, they don't see how the sausage is made, as they say. Uh, I know you have to go soon, Donald. So I want to. Uh, we're going to stick around and keep going for a few more minutes, and we got book recommendations coming up. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything that you wanted to point people at, where people should, if they say, "Gosh, this Donald guy." He is a good-looking dude with a lot of great ideas, and I need the I need more of this this guy in my life. Where can they find you online? Where can people find out more about you? I think the best place would be my uh, site, my website, sevencylinders.com, the number seven. And I've got several projects that are getting completed this month, and so I'm excited to share like this library piece that Sheridan and I have been working on. That's been a lot of fun. That's going to be released next month, and then a project I've been doing in collaboration with the Heidelberg Project in Detroit, the Museum of Art, and that's a project where I approached it very much sort of as a documentarian collecting portraits of people and, and landscape footage, and then using green screen and some motion uh, tracking and graphics, I'm mashing it all together with sort of a, with kids reading a rhyme, and it's, mm. it's sort of adding a lot of different creative elements together. I'm excited to get it finished next month and, and share it as well. So yeah, I'd say my website's a good place to keep tabs on my projects. And your seven cylinders on Twitter as well. Yes. All right. Well, Donald, thank you so much for making time to be here today. And uh, I'll look forward to when the video drops of the summer game uh, trailer. Uh, and I hope to have you back to talk longer about this subject. This is so. great. Thanks for having me on, Jersey. And good to meet you, Cole and Sherrod. Uh, I'll see you soon. Donald, <laughs> thanks. Bye. All right. So while, uh, while Donald leaves and uh, Rachel comes in to do book recommendations. I had a qu another couple questions, quick ones for you guys, uh, Cole and Sherrod. Two things that I think get overlooked a lot in a lot of visual storytelling um, are color and sound. And I know, I know those got to be important to filmmakers. So I'm wondering, I start with Cole. How important or how do you th approach thinking about color and or sound when you're working on your projects? Because, I mean, especially in a fantasy story where, like, the dragon's only going to be as authentic as the full presence. Right, right. Um, color, just color real quick, it's something I've, I've, I've never... It's interesting because with film, you can do a lot of things after the fact um, on both sound and color. You can, you can, the, you know, you can see, you can shoot stuff, and you're like, this looks horrible, and then the colorist gets it, and it looks great. You know what I'm saying? And it's hard. I still struggle with seeing the potentials of what the colorist can do and cannot do. Yeah. Um, but I have been thinking a lot more about it lately just because I feel, I feel like it is important, and I know that there's a lot more to learn. So I don't really know how educated is a comment I can make on color um, other than I think it's super important and probably doesn't get enough thought. I, well, I, I also think color gets too much gravitas when people talk about it as well. I think there's a balance between, like, because sometimes it's like, I want this to feel happy. What color are we going to use? Well, we're going to use warm colors, right? You know, you don't have to, to necessarily have, like, a degree in color theory, although some people would argue that. But it's just I was curious if, like, if this is something that in, in your process of making a thing, if, if it's on your mind. Um, you know, I think it is, but a lot of times, um, well, the nice thing is, is that you can you can hire like production designers who will generally know more about color than you, <laughs> uh, or at least me. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, 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 and the same thing with cinematographer, but a lot of times when you're working at a low budget, you can't really design a lot of things. Um, you can add things sure. But when it comes to, you know, like, 
a lot of times a lot the color that you have control over is like what the 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 character your main character is wearing and what you want to you know do they wear warms do you, you know, like you said cools do you you stuff like that yeah um the but flipping over to sound which i think is very similar in the way like it, it it's funny we were making a joke the other day about how sound guys and sound people be, i've I've rarely worked with a sound woman, but I'm sure they're out there. Anyway, uh, they tend to be really angry people. And really? Yeah, like, I, don't, and I, I mean, I know a few that are just awesome, but for the most part, it's like they get really frustrated because they feel like thought sound is an afterthought, which it is, and it shouldn't be, but it is. And a lot of times you're just trying to get your shot, you're trying to get it, and the sound guy's like, I don't even, I can't get close enough. I can't get good sound on this. And you say, don't worry about it. I just got to get the shot. <laughs> um, and they get really angry and they feel like they feel like they're secondary citizens on set. And I think that that, oh, that prevalent attitude kind of shows how we don't think about it. And then, and then once we get into the edit room, we start thinking about it. And so I definitely think like color it can be it can be thought of a little bit more um but it doesn't get a lot of thought because you don't have to deal with it in the moment you can come back and you can hire a sound guy a sound designer and you can come in and you know like when we were designing the orcs you know I was like use a tiger use a you know like we kind of took a tiger and then we took an alligator and then you know like we kind of melt, built it but I had time to just sit on the couch and have the sound guy pretend like try and try and then we finally said no that's good but on set you're just like how bad was that train in the background yeah. oh it was okay all right well let's move on you know what i'm saying right right there, there's so i don't know like i i i feel like i mean ultimately in the end they are but because they're not right away because they're not like right in like when you're shooting they get pushed off to post production and then again it's just you know hiring somebody who's good who can who can build your world for you so well, i would i would argue that that is that's very similar to the way uh, comics are often produced where the coloring happens at the back end right there's a penciler and inker or pencil inker artist who does the line art or even if they they're their own colorist they do the coloring after the fact right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then the lettering is all done later in the game as well so a lot of the sound design in comics is done on the back end you don't have to think about it much and you don't because like one of the things that i get you know, really uh, jacked up about is when I'm reading a comic where the sound elements, the, meaning the word balloons and the sound effects, all contribute to the overall composition and they contribute in a way that makes logical sense in the context of the story where it's communicating the intonation and quality of the noises going on, whether it's somebody's voice or whether it's a sound effect. So when I see that all happening well, I get super excited. But then when I see somebody just like, oh, you took the font impact and they kind of put it crooked and made it red. That's, that's not good sound design. That would be the equivalent of just getting like a, a public domain sound bank off the internet. <laughs> and when somebody falls down, you hear that Hanna-Barbera bang effect, right? Right, so, right. So whether you're thinking it up front or in the back end, it's like something I think a lot of beginning storytellers miss out on is they think of color and sound as ornamentation, to quote my friend Dan Mishkin, rather than as like an integral part of the overall storytelling experience. Sherrod, I'm wondering if you, what you, how hard you think about these two things now that I just blew them up into massively important things. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I, I, I think they're so important. And, you know, I come from a background in illustration and yeah. painting, so I often like will watch my edits uh, with the sound off just to check out visually how it feels. And at the same time, I'll listen to my sound mixes with no image to mm. see if I can still get a feel for the environment and the story. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm doing a, uh, working on the sound mix of a feature length narrative right now. And I actually mute all the dialogue and watch the scenes with all the sound effects and all the environmental sounds in there but if the character's mouths are moving, nothing's coming out. And I love watching it that way to see how it feels, you know? Mm. So I'm, I'm really starting to um, pay attention to just how important that is. Uh, you know, audiences are used to Hollywood scale soundscapes and Hollywood style gr uh, color grading, you know, color styling in, in movies. And uh, 
I think it's important for people who are working on, a, on an independent level to, to, to realize that if they put some time into that, it, it really, um, the quality, the, the perceived quality of their piece increases, you know, mm. whether the audience even knows it or not, that, that that's what they're appreciating. They do appreciate it. No, that, that's what you just call like production values, right? It's like, right. Yeah. Right. Production values. I mean, some people, you know, literally think of production values as the props or the costumes, right. you know, that are there when you shoot, but yeah, definitely the sound and, and the post-production, the styling that you give it. Yeah. But you're, you know, you bringing up coloring and comics is, it's so interesting because there's been so many comics that when they first come out, like at least a, a while back, they'd come out, you know, monthly issues that would be black and white. And then they would put out a compilation where the whole thing gets put together and then colored, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and there's a huge difference there in the drama, I think. I mean, there's strength to either one because you interpret colors if something's black and white. And there's strength to letting your audience interpret things because then they make it personal you know they they fill it in with colors in their imagination that you could never get to but yeah you know the controlling of the color by by putting out a comic in color you can really like you're saying a happy scene you know in the most basic terms is warm or or if something is desolate it's cold colors you know that yeah. that stuff really works <laughs> yeah and i also think of that that joke of um you know how all action summer blockbuster movie trailers now use that blom sound yeah <laughs> a friend of mine recently said like every summer blockbuster film trailer they got the lights off because everything's always really dark and, yeah. and they all you hear is that giant tuba noise like that's like the signal of summer blockbuster movie and it's, it, <laughs> and it's like well we found out what works after all i guess but but it's like it's what what are they trying to sell you they're trying to sell you this is going to rock you to the core. So what do they do? They use these big, deep sounds, and they use all of these gray, muted tones, right? Cole's right. nodding enthusiastically. Right. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> and it's, I mean, I think the mate, I think uh, Inception was the first one that did that. Yeah. And it's like, that's the legacy. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. just saw the Godzilla trailer, and like I was like, oh, there it is. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. But but uh, but yeah, it's it's, uh, it's something that I think uh, it, it's it's I like putting a little hat on that one and saying like, hey, color and sound are critical parts of the overall storytelling process. And I also like the idea of like, um, I'm wondering if you guys do this with your actors, with pacing, uh, with dialogue. Like, okay, can we try it, his girl Friday style? Can we try it slower now and seeing how like the because one of the things that I find in my own work is when I'm thumbnailing a scene is the dialogue will not necessarily be fully formed yet in my head but i'll have a sense of the rhythm of it uh and it's almost like i'm listening through a door like i'm hearing <laughs> like it's it's really silly to say but like that's how the dialogue pacing feels to me before i even know exactly what is being talked about mm -hmm. um so i'm wondering if you guys mess around with that when you're doing your films too like having them do multiple takes of different speeds to see how it adds or subtracts from the scenes cole um yeah, I it, again, you know, it's 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 funny because like even on like this film that I'm editing, you know, it you only get about three takes just at the at your rate at your current rate. So a lot of times that's pre like you sit down and you talk. Like I always I always call my actors and say this is kind of how I see your you know, or even in the audition, you know, you're like this. I see this guy being like this guy and you know to give them some frame of reference um but yeah i mean there's definitely there's definitely times where uh i have them you know like okay i need you to slow down i need you to say this faster um i think that there's i mean like you know the famous the the idea that comes to me is like uh, david mamet i think it was david mamet he always you would use like a metronome right like and he would have his actors having this ticking in the background as they, you know, and they would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And, and if you watch his stuff, he has like a very, very specific cadence. Like everything is, it's almost as if there is a metronome ticking away. Hmm. Um, I, I have never gotten to the point where I want, like I've always kind of wanted to try that. I always wanted to see what that would bring, that would bring forth in an actor. Um, but I think at the, at the end, you're just, you know, it, um, it's a lot on the characterization. You know what I'm saying? I think that's probably what you're talking about is you, you, you hear a certain, you hear a certain pacing 
that's probably informed by the characters that you're, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. all characters don't talk the same speed. Sure. And so, you know, you're hearing it because you're hearing these two characters are making music together and you're not sure what they're going to say, but that's kind of, I would say that, I would say the characters are probably more informing it than. Oh, that's like, a great way to put it, Cole. The characters making music together in like the, the, the tone intonation and pacing uh, and cadence. Oh, that's so good. Because like you can have harmony and you can have cacophony, right? Uh, depending on what you want to get out of the scene and depending on what the character's motivations and reactions are informing in that. Ooh, I love and then that. You, and then you get in the editing room and totally change it. <laughs> 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 I wanted to give Sharon a chance to respond to that initial point before we switch over to book recommendations. So uh, is this something you mess with as well, Sharon? Definitely, but you know, on an indie budget, like uh, like you were saying, that you know, you don't you get three takes. You don't have you don't have the room to to do all variety or all versions of the scene that could possibly form from all your different creative you know people there. So what I do, I do sketches of the scene beforehand, like the week before. I'll get the actors together, or even if I can't get the actors, I'll get stand-in actors and actually do sketches of the scene and we don't even have to go to the real location it could be in the living room and i'll shoot those and watch them and try to figure out you know oh where where can this go so i i will do i do like that playing of you know uh letting them improvise or switch up the pacing or even add lines subtract lines but on an indie budget i end up doing that in rehearsals more so than on the actual set that's pretty dang smart. <laughs> I, I don't always do that, but I think it's a great idea. <laughs> it's, it's a good idea for a dramatic scene. Like if it's an important scene, it's, it's a good idea, I think. You know? yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and from, from a cartoonist standpoint, that would mean just sketch it out on paper. You know, make right. sketches on paper of the scene, uh, a variety of different gestures and poses and, and so on. Yeah. Right. Uh, from a music, musical musician standpoint, it would be the same thing as a jam session and a demo, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah, I can, I, yeah the, the, the parallels are all the way there. It's just it, yeah. trying to convince my young students to draw a page three times is always tough. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta draw three times. Like, yeah, you gotta do a, a little tiny thumbnail, a bigger thumbnail, and then the full page. Ah, oh, nuts. <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, you know, I mentioned you guys perhaps uh, early on that we were gonna be doing book recommendations. You guys don't have to do this, but if you have some books that you would recommend to people, um, now's the time to think about them. And then uh, I'm gonna kick over to Rachel Moyer of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aadl.org. Uh, you're kind of uh, doing more and more of the comics programming now. I am. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Um, oh, yep. Yeah. This <laughs> we microphone, go. we it's like an ongoing battle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So uh, hope hopefully more, uh, even more. Fingers crossed. It's yeah. a lot of fun. You're gonna be around for Kids Read Comics this summer, yes. If not in an official capacity, I'll be here just because it's fun. Okay, cool. Okay, good. So, uh, but yes, you are also, uh, you not only uh, were conscripted into doing the comics programming, you are a huge comics nerd. And if people follow you oh, yeah. on Twitter or any place else where you post things, t Tumblr, yes? Mm, not as much? Nah. Uh, well, they'll see that, that few people love Lois Lane the way you love <laughs> Lois Lane. <laughs> It's one of those things where I start to get a little embarrassed if I talk about it too much, but yeah, I, I could go on tirades. It's look, it's a thing. I, but, I, um, I, I've openly admitted that I go to Transformers conventions on purpose. You could admit how much you love Lois Lane in public. Oh, it's not so much the love that is embarrassing, it's just the babbling that ensues <laughs> afterwards. I don't, I don't mind admitting how nerdy I get. It's just okay. the, the stream of word the vomit that comes out just kind of... Knocks people over, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you just be careful about how how you talk about it in mixed company. I understand that. <laughs> All right. So what do you what do you got to recommend for uh, people who are interested in the discussion that we had today? What comics should people be reading? Well, I tried to keep a uh, movie theme going here. It might be a little tenuous, uh, <laughs> but uh, the first book I have, and I'm totally cheating. This is actually the sequel uh, for my out. visual aid because I don't have the first book available to me right now, but it's White Out by Greg Rucka and Steve Lieber. It's um, 
it had a movie ad- adaptation, which is my movie link here. The, yeah, okay. Yeah. The movie adaptation was pretty much panned universally. Oh, that's too bad. Which is interesting considering that the book was Eisner nominated. So. The, oh, the source material is fantastic. Steve yes, Lieber's yes. storytelling? <laughs> forget about it. It's great. Right. It, it's a fairly straightforward murder mystery, but it's made extra interesting by the fact that it takes place in Antarctica. Uh, it features a U.S. Marshal by the name of Carrie Stetko, and there's a a science outpost there in Antarctica, and someone just turns up dead, and it it's a very tense in- story that uh, is unsurprisingly in black and white. Yeah, yeah Antarctica crime, not yeah. surprising. But it is a, I think, a good study in a really muted kind of story. Everything is made more tense by the fact that it is in black and white. That it it is, doesn't have sound. We're talking about sound mm-hmm. here. Um, I think it actually works better in the comic medium because it is silent medium. So. Mm-hmm. To get a little art need, nerdy about it. Well, and and also Rucka's uh, dialogue style is more reserved yeah. in Whiteout than compared to things that he wrote for DC Comics. Yes, right? it's very reserved. There's not a lot of back and forth. There's, uh, I guess, a little bit maybe more voiceover narration, but it, even that is just very sort of staccato. I think it's been a while since I read it, but I remember it having a lot to do with a lot of uh, the story was about her sense of isolation. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. The the ice, as it's called, Antarctica, is very much a present character in it. It's mm. very much about this isolation, and um, not just isolation in terms of being away from everyone, but being isolated in that the main character is not well liked. There's rumors going all around that she's there because she killed someone. She's there mm. because, you know, her career is totally on a downward spiral. She's kind of exiled from the United States, as it were, mm. with this position. So. It's uh, internal isolation that kind of projects itself on the environment as well. So mm. it's a pretty tense read. Yeah, and and it's and and also talking about limitations, you're dealing with a landscape that is just white, and mm-hmm. you got to make it look visually interesting. And Lieber pulls it off. So yeah. next, I see a book that I recognize. Yeah, yeah. this uh, talk about a 180. Uh, <laughs> tense isolation to colorful 1980s humor superheroes. Um, Justice League International. Yes, Justice League International. This. Uh, collects the first six issues of Justice League, and then it became Justice League International after that. Now, and we should say, like, for context, because Justice League has had a lot of iterations. Oh, yes. Yes. So this was uh, in the late 80s. Mm-hmm. It was coming off of Justice League. Before that was in Detroit. Yes. Run by Martian Manhunter and characters like Vibe and Gypsy and so on. But then mm-hmm. along comes Keith Giffen, J.M. DeMattis, and Kevin McGuire. They reinvented the Justice League after a big event called Legends. Right. And th- this is what you might uh, hear called the Bwahaha year. Of the Justice years, League. Yes. This is the Justice League with a lot of humor and kind of uh, interpersonal problems going on. This is where you're going to have Blue Beetle and Booster Gold being like the, you know, buddy sitcom stars of DC and all mm-hmm. that. And I absolutely love Kevin Maguire's pencils. Mm-hmm. Um, this is my tenuous movie connection here is the acting. We've had this conversation yep. before about yep. how. When you're doing comic art, it's great to, uh, you know, think of your drawings as your actors and to try and have them perform for you in the same way with body language and facial expressions. And Kevin Maguire, he uh, has pretty unique stylings. This is a pretty famous couple of pages here. Yeah, Batman, punch out Guy Garner. What you'll, if you look through his work, what you'll see is he renders facial expressions that aren't always the prettiest, but are pretty realistic. And... They, they really like. They change the pacing and flow of the story quite a bit. They mm-hmm. the art really works for the story. And you know, I'm not talking about the story itself very much here. But right. Justice League International is pretty great too, just for the humor. If you want to read a superhero story with the team dynamic that is, you know, not so much grim and gritty or trying to be. You know, and and serious. not not necessarily big bombastic fun either, because there's like a whole I- issue where Guy Gardner and Ice go on a date, and Blue Beetle pranks him. That's the whole story. Yep, there's no yep. supervillain in that one, right? right? And then you've got a uh, you know Booster Gold and Blue Beetle setting up their uh, resort. <laughs> that's right. Where that's the, a good, that's where a good that's one. frequented by <laughs> supervillains and all that. So yeah, it's 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 sort of like Seinfeld. It's like Seinfeld as a superhero story. Yes. Know? 
and that's what made it so great. But but what, I'll I'll underline what you said about Maguire is he can make a character go yeah well, and he can capture that emotion with a curl of a lip, and you don't have to use dialogue because he gets it out of his actors mm -hmm. in the comic. Yeah. All right. So now we've got Star Wars. All right. And. Okay, I'm not going to explain that movie connection. That's pretty obvious. This is <laughs> Star Wars, Tag and Bank Were Here, which collects two series, which was Tag and Bank Were Dead and Tag and Bank 2. This is basically Star Wars meets um, The Life of Brian. If you're a Monty Python fan or you just really like uh, humorous um, references or if you just love Star Wars, this is a great book to go to. And the art is extremely expressive. Uh, like, here's one of the covers from... The book series you can see that they have a very animated uh set of expressions but basically it follows around these two characters named tag and bank who are behind the scenes and on pretty much everything happening in star wars and it's a lot of like them tripping up and accidentally causing a lot of scenes that happen within the movies yeah so it's also a little bit of ever Forrest showing Gump. up yeah it's, yeah yeah it's, it's a, a lot of good fun yeah, it's it's a pretty funny comic series. And that's from Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. uh, Tag and Bink were here. All right, well, thank you, Rachel. Are there any events coming up at AADL that we should know about? Uh, the, the next forum is April 4th, yes? April 6th, actually. April 6th. Yeah, and that's Joshua Hockey, I believe. We'll Joshua be, Hoke is going to we'll be, be here to talk about Tales from the Brothers 3. Yeah, Auto that should Bio be fun. Um, I believe we also have an event that might be of interest to folks this Saturday, which is um, a computer animation um character design workshop uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be here uh march 8th so if you, you know what program they're using you know i'm not sure i know it's the folks over at game start okay. who are teaching and that's you know teens it up it should be interesting yeah, 3d mm -hmm. character design uh very cool uh i'm guessing it's something like blender or something like that but you know i'm not even sure if it's 3d i think it's more focused on um the visual programming part of it. So oh. it may even be something like Scratch. I wish I knew, but okay, it does well, you sound like it's a se event series. Okay. So it it's at aadl.org. Yeah, check aadl.org uh, backslash events and info's all there. Also, Mini Comics Day is March 22nd at the Duderstadt in Ann Arbor uh, at North Campus. So that's at lib.umich.edu slash day. Just search for Mini Comics Day Ann Arbor. Um, we're going to get together for eight hours and try to do an eight-page mini comic in that eight hours. So uh, I'll be there. You should be too. Uh, lib.umich.edu. Okay. I got to respect people's time here. We're already way over time. Uh, Sherrod and, and Cole, um, did you guys have any book recommendations you wanted to make or do you just need to get out of here? <laughs> I uh, I was gonna say I just uh, this might be obvious, but I just finished reading Sandman for the mm. first time. For the first and, time, uh, it rocked my world. I was watching <laughs> I was watching The Wire during the same time period, roughly, and I was like, kind of struck at how similar they were, mm. um, in just the fact that they kind of didn't really stick with a one. You know, like The Wire kind of drifts off into different side characters, as did. Uh, Sandman. So, huh. I thought that was great. So Sandman deserves the the praise it gets. I would say yes, and <laughs> I kind of feel like I saw a lot of the roots of um, comic series now, like Fables and other series like that, where where like definitely were rooted in in Sandman. So it was it was fun to see. So Neil Gaiman Sandman. Fables is also great. Uh, Fables is fantastic. Bill Willingham's Fables. Uh, have you ever read his stuff he did in the '80s, Elementals, his no. su his superhero deconstruction series? It was it was basically uh, it's pre Watchmen, uh, maybe it was post Watchmen, but it's it's very uh, well. It's 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 like if if somebody did an HBO superhero show where not everybody's very nice and everybody has real problems, and it's done in the, the way that Bill Willingham does it. So uh, yeah. Elementals well, is great. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I I I love fables, so yeah. Sure. Elementals is that treatment on superheroes. Um, so, Sherrod, uh huh. A anything that you would recommend that people go check out? To uh, not necessarily a comic, but it could also be a book on like this particular discussion that we had. Well, I mean, it's it's funny because you're talking about a Star Wars offshoot uh, um, comic. I, I was going to bring up. There's a hardcover book. I, I don't even. I don't. I think it's out in paperback now. It's the making of Star Wars, the definitive story behind the original film. And it is a meticulous, detailed book that talks about 
the whole process of where this movie came from, you know, in the early 70s, through all these draft story drafts, to the casting, to the production, to the editing, and all the problems. And I mean, it, you know, it's coming from the perspective of like, uh, you know, a lot of a research and interviews. So uh, it's just filled with, uh, it's filled with the good and bad <laughs> that went into what ultimately became like, you know, one of the most successful movies, you know, uh, uh, and stories, I guess you could say, of all time. Uh, and so it, uh, I would recommend that. Huh. Based on the based on my perspective coming from narrative film. Yeah. And the title again was? It's it's the making of Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> the definitive story behind the original film. All right, cool. Uh <laughs> guys, I can't thank you enough for all the time that you gave me today. Uh thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and sharing all of these uh great thoughts on storytelling. So uh let's go around the horn and give everybody a chance uh to say what is the one thing that you hope people will check out today. Cole, what's the one thing that you hope people will go and click on uh, upon leaving this podcast? In general, like in life in general? <laughs> <laughs> For you. The, that, that directly benefits you. Oh, um, I would say check out my Twitter. It's kind of become my, my central hub. Um, I don't update my website as often, but uh, yeah, my Twitter, which is just Cole Glass Twitter dot com forward slash cold glass k o k o h l glasses yeah. in k o h l like the store and then and then glass like the the transparent material that we have on our houses oh, yeah yeah all right and and yes you, you do post lots of uh sometimes very comical things and uh sometimes philosophical things yeah right? it's and it's funny because that kind of started and it still is where i kind of like I'll, sometimes i'll think of a funny line with no story or character to attach it to I throw it on Twitter. Oh, and are you? Do you watch the reactions to those to measure how effective? Ah, I do. And here's the funny thing: I prefer Twitter over Facebook, but I have way more response on Facebook. So interesting. Yeah, and sometimes people are like, "Oh, you can't say something like that. Like, don't don't be hard on yourself." And I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> that wasn't really me talking, if you know what I'm saying." But <laughs> do you need to put quotations around it? I, yeah, I don't know. Oh, interesting. No, I see. I just took it as you just just playing around, playing around. Yeah, with well, text. it is. I mean, it is. But there have been times when I'm like, I need a funny line, so I get on my Twitter and I start scrolling through to see if I had one that I remembered. That is pretty cool. No, I I do very I do something very similar with Instagram where I will post like I'll take excerpts of the sketches where it's like I think there's something here, there's mm. something in this this sketch that I did, but I don't know for sure, and I'll post it to Instagram. Who? How does how do people react? Do people react positively, very positively, or not at all? Okay, well, not right. a lot of people thought anything of that, so I guess I can put that one away. So, right, right. Uh, but that's easier. I, people don't think that I'm actually expressing anything about my day when I draw a robot girl pouting. You know, right. Uh, right. That's funny. But like yesterday, I I tweeted about how I would prefer to create naked. Yeah. It's not true about myself. I can't do anything without pants on. <laughs> but you know, like I thought it was a funny thing to say. You yeah. know, and like on Facebook, people are like, "Oh, like there was like a lot of comments on like my morality and stuff like that." And so I was kind of like, <laughs> "Seriously?" You know. Like people were like, "Oh, shame!" shame. Yeah, like <laughs> it was kind of like people thought I really believed that, and so I was like, well. and I don't, I don't correct them. I let them believe it. That's fine. <laughs> Finally, somebody who uses Twitter and Facebook right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Not uh, serious at all. <laughs> so Cole Glass on Twitter to hear him write about uh, being naked. Uh, and then, Sharon, where can people find more of your stuff? Where's the one thing that you want people to go visit today? I think if you, if you just look me up, uh, if you look up my Twitter account under UFO Club 1977, you'll find the link to my website, which is sharedcamppatel.com where I have uh, links to a lot of my short films and, and work, and it'd just be great to have uh, comments or, or just views. All right. So, yeah, people can interact with your stuff there. Yeah. 
and mm -hmm. thumb it up. Speaking of thumbing it up, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, you know it'd be a great way to support the show is give a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. If you're listening to the audio podcast, go to iTunes, give us a star review, however many you think we deserve. I think we deserve a lot. Uh, and then I, I appreciate that. I really do. I, I look at the reviews, and the nice ones make me feel really, really good. So if you want to make Jersey feel really, really good t today, that'd be a great way to do it. Uh, Rachel, anything else that you wanted to promote? Any place that you wanted people to say where they could find you or no? Well, I have a Twitter account, which is Rachel J. Moyer uh, at Twitter.com. I can't say that it will all be on topic to this kind of stuff here. No. Uh, like, not at all. But uh, <laughs> if you want more relevant information, I would direct everybody to go to aadl.org or comics.aadl.org, where we'll, we have a lot of blog posts with more recommendations and information on our upcoming events that might be of interest to folks that like this kind of thing. So, Very cool. Go there. All right, but if they want to hear about Lois Lane, they could follow you up on Twitter. Yes, they could. <laughs> <laughs> when, when when you you watch an episode of, uh, of anything, uh, well, I was gonna say uh, <laughs> Smallville, and then you get mad, and then you start firing off like a long, you know, 120 tweet missive about Lois. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I find it entertaining. <laughs> Uh, but okay, well, thank you, Rachel, for the great book recommendations and for all the help with comics.adl.org. Thank you to Cole Glass and to Sherrod Patel and to Donald Harrison of sevencylinders.com. Thanks to Matt Dubay in the control room for putting on this show every two weeks. Thanks to Eric Kloster for mo monitoring the chat and collecting all the links that we talk about during the show. This show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG94. Uh, and we will be back in two weeks. And until then, I've been Jersey Droves of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. See ya.